you tonight. Okay. Um, I want to start off by thanking sincerely the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and the, the people that, 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 that are here today and the researchers that, are, that you're, you're listening to and the members of the panel, thank you, thank you, thank you. And many of you may have had direct personal experiences of serious mental illnesses or you know someone with a serious mental illness and researchers and people like you in the audience, we have great hope that we can do better. And the take home message for you today is keep that hope because we are making progress. So wh why have, like, if the foundation's given out $400 million, why haven't we cured schizophrenia yet? Well, that's a good question. We put a man on the moon 50 years ago. The reason is that schizophrenia is much harder and mental disorders are much more complex than putting a man on the moon. They are much, much more complex. But with your support and with the research members of the, the members of the research community, we are making progress. And what I want to share with you today is my journey, uh, trying to find my dream is to prevent schizophrenia. So we don't have to have people that get medications that don't work completely. And uh, and uh, and that that that's the dream. I think it's a. I may not be alive to see it, but I'm sure it's going to happen. And I want you to have that hope as well. So. I'm, if, have any, any of you in the audience been to Galileo's museum in Florence? Anyone been to, to this museum? Fantastic, isn't it? Please do look at the, go to this museum. So Galileo made this incredible comment. It's very concise. You can put it on a bumper sticker. Measure. This is, this is, how, he, this is how he said, this is how science should operate. You should measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not so. So what he's saying is, measure what you can, what you can't measure, make up some, make, get, a, get better instruments. That's what you'll be hearing from the previous speaker, Christoph talking about optogenetics, and Alan talking about ways to measure things in, in biosamples. So what, what we're trying to do, what, what, what you can see at the gallery here, at the, at the museum, is Galileo's first telescope. And with that telescope, he pointed to the moon and saw that there were these interesting things on the moon's surface. That, that he thought they were lakes. He didn't know they were craters. And then he decided he wanted to see more. He made a bigger microscope, a bigger telescope, I beg your pardon, and he saw the rings of Saturn. And then he, he made an even bigger telescope and he saw the moons of Jupiter. And this is what scientists need to do. We need to measure things we can and make instruments that can measure more. And that's the, the journey that I want to take you on. So as the, Mr. Chairman, as the Chairman said, I, I'm interested in epidemiology. And my father is a plumber. So I'm interested in hydraulic models of mental illness and hydraulics of <laughs> e epidemiology. So I want to, this is the, a small lesson for you. There will be a quiz later on. I'll ask you about whether you remember this. So, so this is the hydraulic. So incidence is the number of new cases. And incidence, you think of it like water coming into the tap. You turn the tap on, and this is the number of new people coming in, say, with schizophrenia or any mental disorder. And the prevalence is what's in the, in the tank. Now, there are two ways to to get out of that tank, you can recover, and many people with schizophrenia do recover, but not enough, or you can die. And it's a very sober fact is that, that mental illnesses are lethal, not just through suicide, but increased risk of a lot of other preventable disorders like cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease. And I've done a lot of work on incidence, and we find that the incidence of schizophrenia, for example, varies across the, the planet. We don't know why. And the prevalence of schizophrenia varies, and when we look at mortality, there are some very sobering results coming out. We published a paper last Friday based on our work in Denmark. It's, a big, it's the biggest study ever done on mortality and mental illnesses. We looked at all mental disorders, and we came up with a new, new measure. It's like that like measure what is measurable, make measurable what is not. We, 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 we're using a new way to measure premature mortality. And we found on average that men lose 10 years of life after the development of any mental disorder, and women lose, on average, seven years of life. That's very sobering news. That paper was published in The Lancet last Friday. You can Google it, or you can Google my name, or email me. I'll send you some more information about that. So, but, but in fact, what I want to do is not only reduce mortality and, and make more people recover through better treatments, I actually want to turn that tap off. I want to reduce the incidence of schizophrenia. I want to prevent schizophrenia. And that's what I'll be talking about today. 
Ellen and I published a paper many years ago, and we're two very much kindred spirits. We like to measure things in the community. We count incidents, we count recovery, we look at the risk of infection or prenatal exposures to nutritional agents. And so our laboratory are the, uh, the general population. And uh, I don't know whether you've seen this cartoon, but it actually captures brilliantly the problems with epidemiology. I don't want to oversell this. So here's the bored newsreader, and he's spinning a wheel down. He's got his finger on the button. And this is today's random medical news from the New England Journal of Panic-Inducing Gobbledygook. <laughs> so he's spinning this wheel here, like coffee, smoking, stress, red wine, causes glaucoma, depression, feelings of well-being in rats, men, twins, children. <laughs> and you see this, like, chocolate's good for you. No, no, chocolate's bad for you. Aluminium saucepans cause dementia. No, they don't. Um, and um, and this, this is the problem with, sometimes we, uh, we look at, at correlation. We can't really be sure we've got the whole story. So this makes it a, a harder task for us. Uh, but we're very tenacious people. And one of the things that, that has really influenced or, or imprinted on my research career is I'm trying to find risk factors that we can do something about. We want to provide, and Ellen's very much of the same ilk here. We're trying to find things that are, that are common, that are preventable, like smoking, exposure to, 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 to tobacco, or prenatal infection, or, or nutritional agents. And I'm going to t remind you about the complexity of the brain. You know, we're saying that we put a man on the moon 50 years ago, but we still don't really understand how the brain works. The brain takes instructions from the genetic material that we inherit from our mother and our father, and it also takes instructions from everything around it, the environment. And as soon as the baby opens its eyes or starts listening, it, that brain is rewiring in response to that. And this is like, it's a, it's a little bit complex. This is a car, but you multiply that by many fold, and that's the brain. So the key, the key lesson for you, one, one of the messages I want you to understand, is the developing brain expects instructions. It's experience expectant. You may not have heard those words before. It draws the instructions from what's going on around it. And this is, I think, some of the factors that epidemiology is looking at. Sometimes you, 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 you have up changes in the genetic makeup. Sometimes you have changes in the environmental makeup, where you're going to have a knockout or some type of event in the environment. And I want to emphasize that social and cultural factors are absolutely critical. To, to build a healthy brain, you need that type of loving relationship. And, uh, and if, we, if you don't get that, then you're, then you're at risk of a whole range of mental disorders, physical disorders, poor education, crime, et cetera. So I don't want to particularly focus on the social factors in schizophrenia. They are generic across all outcomes. So here are some of the candidate modifiable risk factors. Alan's talked a little bit about pregnancy and birth complications, but they're bad for the developing brain. Full stop. Any mental disorder may be increased risk. Infection, nutrition. I'm going to mention cannabis, trauma exposure. I won't go into details. So when I started in my research, I thought probably cannabis did not cause schizophrenia. But many mums and dads would say, uh, John, my son only got schizophrenia when he started to smoke, smoke cannabis. And we kind of thought, well, maybe he, was, he or she was self-medicating. We could never really clear, get what the order of events was. So I, did, I used the best telescope I could. It was a birth cohort in Brisbane. H have any of you seen those documentaries, Seven Up, where they follow the kids? So this is like seven up for 8,000 kids in Brisbane, and Ellen's uh, cohorts in Finland are similar. So we, we had 7,000 mothers coming into a hospital in Brisbane. We followed them up the few, first few days after birth, age five, age 14, age 21. They're still, 30, they're still being followed up. They're over 30, and now we're following the kids of the kid, the kids of the cohort. So we asked, we looked at their mental health at 21, and we asked them, when did you start using cannabis? And we found that if you use cannabis at an earlier age, like less than 14, you had an increased risk of getting schizophrenia or hearing voices. And you didn't actually need to have a full disorder of, of, of psychosis. But it could be that there was some other risk factor there that we, could, we didn't measure. And this is like that, that, that cartoon with the bored newsreader spinning the wheel. But we had a little trick we could play where we could do this. We could look at siblings. Because some of the mothers came in and had their second, I thought, an, an additional child during this study. You'll recognize these famous people. Do you know who these people are? <laughs> so, so this is where we, where we said, 
uh, if both siblings were using cannabis, so if Liam started, oh, that's Chris, is it? I could tell my part. Um, Chris started to use cannabis when he was 14 and Liam when he was 15. Was there any difference? Now, they have the same mother and mostly the same father and they grew up together. One had the top bunk or the lower bunk, but they were exposed to a shared environment. And what we found really surprised me. When we looked at the siblings within the cohort, the sibling that started to use cannabis earlier had an increased risk of developing psychosis or hearing voices compared to the, the other sibling. So that, to me, is about the, you can't do a randomized control trial. You smoke cannabis for 20, 10 years, you don't. We'll see who gets schizophrenia. That's not going to happen. But that, that was um, uh, some type of evidence that we could extract out of these data. And now I'm going to take you on a journey. And this journey's been going on like 10, 15 years. Um, uh, Fuller Tory once said to me, John, everyone's entitled to one delusion. And my delusion, maybe low vitamin D might be a risk factor for schizophrenia. And I'll share with you this, this theory. So we've d you may not be aware that if you're born in winter or spring, you have a slightly increased risk of going on to get schizophrenia. Did anyone know that? OK, it's not your star sign, OK? It's not, it's not astrology. <laughs> we have winter in the middle of the year in, in, in Australia, where I live. And it, it, it goes with, the, with that risk as well. And then we looked at latitude gradients and incidence and prevalence. We saw, like many disorders, there was a latitude gradient in schizophrenia. Same as multiple sclerosis, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, whole range of skin cancer, whole range of things have latitude gradients. And then we noticed that there's an epidemic of schizophrenia and psychosis in dark-skinned migrants to some countries, particularly cold countries. And it could be that vitamin D, which is the sunshine hormone, it was lower in this group. And what, what really inspired me, and Ellen's already mentioned this to you, but think for a second about folate and spina bifida. Now, sp spina bifida is a disorder of brain development that affects the, the spinal cord. You can see it at birth. It affects walking and a whole range of measures. And maybe a subgroup of schizophrenia, probably a subgroup of schizophrenia, also a disorder of brain development, but it's silent until after puberty, and then it breaks through. But someone doesn't get schizophrenia on the first day that they start hallucinating. Something's gone wrong early on. So how fantastic is this? You can treat, put folate in the bread, and, and you can reduce the incidence of this dreadful um, disorder, spina bifida. So that, made, that galvanized me to explore this. And this is what we did in the spirit of Galileo. We measured the parts of the machinery in the brain linked to, to vitamin D. And this is a highly cited paper. We were the first to do it in humans. And then um, James Kesby, you, who you'll hear after morning tea, and my colleagues did animal models where we took vitamin D out of de developing that brain. We found a whole range of changes. So now we're back to humans, my favorite species. And what we tried to do is measure vitamin D. But we needed to get a better telescope. Because when, when we measure, when people like Alan and I measure the samples from the biobank, you, you know when a newborn baby is born, they get a little prick of blood from their heel. We call it PKU or Guthrie test. And you screen a bunch of things like cystic fibrosis and whatnot. So in Denmark, they've kept those pieces of paper. And we get one little spot, 3.2 millimeters. It's smaller than a piece of confetti. That's all we get. So we needed to make a better telescope to measure vitamin D. This is the machinery that we use. And then we went to Denmark, the fantastic kingdom of Denmark. The Crown Prince Mary is Australian born, so I take a sense of pride as a Niels Bohr professor that, that I'm building more Australian Danish links. And this is David Hugel, uh, who is the director of the uh, Danish National Beer Bank, or Biobank, Daryl Isles, who invented the assay, and a very expensive piece of machinery that I own in Copenhagen. And uh, we discovered an assay that could measure vitamin D in these very old blood spots. And in the kingdom of Denmark, they've kept all the, the pieces of filter paper in a fridge. Everyone is there from prince to pauper. So what did we find? Well, we, first of all, we looked at a sample of about 800, and we found that low vitamin D was linked to increased risk of schizophrenia. Uh, that was interesting. Let's do it again with a bigger sample. We did the sample again with 3,000. And we, we saw it again. So we have not been able to reject this hypothesis yet. And there's a new study going with a new machine, and we're measuring vitamin D in 80,000 newborn babies. So it's going to take a few years. We're about two years into the project. A couple more years, we'll have the results. Ask me back. I'll tell you what, the, what we found. 
And then we're like, Alan, we're very interested in autism. So we did a study in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, and we found that low vitamin D was also linked for autism, another neurodevelopmental disorder. And there's a paper now in press coming out in the next few weeks based from Sweden with my colleagues from the Karolinska Institute, and they found that low vitamin D prenatally was linked to increased risk of autism. And, and again, we're going to do a new study in Denmark in about the next three years. So I want to pull this together with Galileo's uh, watercolors of the moon and our little dried blood spot circles. That's, that's the baby's blood, and these are the little punches where they punch out, and we get one of those little samples sent to Australia. Um, so what we think is happening is if you have low vitamin D, you're taking out some instructions that, that tell the brain to, to grow in a certain way. And vitamin D is a steroid hormone like estrogen or cortisol. It's a big time player. It tells the cells to stop dividing and to, to, to differentiate. And uh, so we think that, we, that vitamin D or anything like low vitamin, Alan mentioned vitamin A and we talked about folate. It may not be a specific micronutrient. It may just be you take out anything that the brain expects and you may disrupt the, the, the trajectory. And the thing about low vitamin D, it's not so common in sunny places like Australia, where I come from, but it's quite common in places like New York and, uh, and northern climates and, and Denmark. So, but we, 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 we still don't know what the critical window is. And uh, our samples in Denmark are based on newborn babies. The blood's taken usually about day three. And then we wondered, well, maybe the window's still open. If that newborn baby has low D for the first year of its life, there's a lot of brain growth happening. Uh, the, 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 after the baby's born, the brain grows very fast. And in fact, by age five, that child has reached his or her adult hat size. The brain is massively growing. And people think of the concept of the first year of life as the fourth trimester. And we wonder whether low D during the fourth trimester, the first year of life, may be a risk factor. I'm going beyond the data now. Uh, we're, we're, this is for speculation, because it opens up a, a remarkable opportunity. And researchers like to dream and, and be, be optimists. And if, we could, if, if, if this window is still open, if we measure vitamin D and we, we could tell the mothers, your baby's got low vitamin D, don't forget to take the recommended vitamin D supplements, maybe, just maybe, we could do some indicated prevention and prevent some of these kids going on to get schizophrenia. And to me, that's thinking the unthinkable, and that's what researchers do. We want to be creative. Um, Brain and Behavior Research Foundation have a, have a track record at funding this type of innovation. So what's next? If the intervention is safe and cheap, like you can go to the pharmacy or your, or your Walgreens and you can get your vitamin D supplements, uh, why don't we just start doing it now? I want to give you two little test cases this is Epidemiology 101. So malaria, one of the most deadly diseases that we face as a species, and um, uh, so it's due to a parasite in the salivary gland of the mosquito, and it's lethal. Um, but ancient Roman physicians made a link between low-lying swamps and increased malaria. Malaria means bad air, malaria. They thought it was bad air coming from the swamps. So they said, let's drain the swamps. Let's see what happens. Guess what? Malaria dropped. They didn't know anything about the mosquito. They didn't know anything about the little parasite in the mosquito's salivary gland. And so sometimes there is a case not to wait for the whole story if the intervention is safe and cheap. And the other amazing story has, come, has happened during my lifetime and your lifetime, and it's cot death, sudden infant death syndrome. So tragic tragic event, healthy babies go to bed and they're dead the next morning. So they'd the epidemiologists would interview those families and the families whose kids were fine and they saw a whole range of risk factors. Well, the, the risk factors linked to cot death were parental socioeconomic status or parental smoking or um, certain types of mattresses or, or internal heating and oh, by the way, the babies were put on their stomach rather than their back. They didn't know which of the risk factors was the causal factor. Uh, but they kept doing the studies, and they kept seeing that the babies were put on their stomach, had an increased risk of cot death, and the babies put on their back. And the, re the reason why babies were put on their back to go to sleep is because of Dr. Spock, not, not Mr. Spock from Star Trek, Dr. Spock, the pediatrician, said this is a good thing to do. So many people of, of our generation, where, where the babies were put on their, on their, on their, on their, on their stomach. Um, so the research community was faced with a decision. 
should we randomize women and babies? Okay, you put your babies on the st your stomach, and you put them on their back, and we'll wait and see what happens. No, 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 no. Just do it. Just do it. And they did. And you know the story? What happens? It's cot death going down, 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 down. Could it be due to this? Probably is. Who cares? Who cares? The babies are living longer. So, um, so, but I don't want to leave you with, uh, like, I'm some type of sort of zealot, some praise the Lord, hallelujah, we've got a cure. We don't, okay? So we're scientists, are very cautious. We, we, we have our delusions. Um, sometimes they're false, and, and um, we, we need to be cautious. So I'm not ready to call this as a done deal. We need more evidence. Um, but you, you, some of you will remember polio. So this is an incredible breakthrough machine in, it's public, uh, from Boston, where this is a machine where they could fit five children with polio in here. There's an empty space there and save these kids' lives. This is an iron lung. And then there's another portable iron lung. Here it is, great breakthrough. And these kept, kept some of these kids alive and some of them recovered and had good function. But, and then uh, physiotherapy and Sister Kenny. Uh, some movie was made about this woman. Um, uh, Rosalind Russell played Sister Kenny. She was a nurse from where I live in Brisbane. Um, and she said, let's get people active quickly. But you know, whilst it is depressing, I think sometimes the treatments we have for schizophrenia are like uh, psychological iron rails. What we really need to do is to, is to have something a little bit more potent to prevent people going on to get schizophrenia. And, and you know this story about the prevention of polio. And this is kind of an incredible test case where we could stop that disorder. So I'm going to wind up now and, and, and ask the tough question, can we prevent schizophrenia? What's the verdict? Well, if you were to go to a criminal court, you would need levels of proof that are beyond reasonable doubt. And we are not there. We, we, are, we have uncertainty. Researchers are cautious. We're full of, uh, full of doubt. And we can, like that, that cartoon about the, the board newsreader, we need to keep rejecting, set up the hypothesis and try to reject it. We have not been able to reject it yet. But I think if you look at the, a lower level of evidence, so using the civil courts, the, based on the balance of probability or the preponderance of evidence, maybe we're nearly there. And I often, I want to leave you with this quote from Voltaire. He said, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So you don't say, well, this is not perfect. You don't have it all sorted out. Actually, this might be good enough to work on now. And I think that's important for us in the research community to remember, to have that hope and, and, to, and, to, um, and, to, and, and sometimes use the best evidence we have there's thousands of people I want to acknowledge. James, you'll meet after morning tea. My friends from um, Denmark, uh, my, my friends from Brisbane, uh, and Niels Bohr Professorship, and in particular, it's a great honor to be one of the co-awardees of the Lieber Prize for Schizophrenia Research from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Thank you very much. <laughs>do you want to say something about vitamin D and prevention of bipolar? Uh, yeah, well, so we, we, will have some, we will have some data on bipolar uh, from the, uh, the study the that's lights. happening in Denmark now, but we don't have any, any evidence yet. Okay. Uh, Dr. Paris? But let me ask you the question. Yeah. Uh, many would say that the schizophrenia is not a homogeneous disease. So therefore, whatever factor you're looking at, may disturb some and develop mental illness and others do nothing. Yes. Could you comment on how you handle that? Yes, so I'm not suggesting for a microsecond that low vitamin D explains the whole story. It's a heterogeneous group of disorders. But I think we, we are starting to look at, um, at genetic risk factors as well. In the, in the recent study that was published from Denmark, we combined genetic risk factors and vitamin D, and we found that they don't interact, they just add up separately. So um, I'm suggesting that um, that, that, we, that there are many paths, there are many ways to break a brain. There are many ways to break a brain. And we, you've heard some from Alan, and you've heard a bunch from me, and there's probably many more that we don't know about yet. So, but if, if there are some things that we can get a handle on, get traction and fix, then it'd be great to be able to turn that incidence tap down and prevent people getting the disease. How about way back? Dr. McGrath, I, I understand that, you know, you're still tentative about this, as, as you have to be, but uh, when you did those smaller, the smaller sample size studies, a couple yeah. of thousand people, 
What was the magnitude of the effect of vitamin the, D? So, good question. The first, uh, first study was about a two, three-fold increased risk, and the second study uh, was smaller. It was about a 1.4 per, uh, 40 percent increase. Actually, I believe the second one. I think there's a, there's a thing that can happen where you get high estimates by chance sometimes, called the winner's curse. Uh, and I think actually we're dealing with a small effect. But ask me again in two years' time when we've got that 80,000 sample. And, uh, but you know, even if it's just like a tiny effect, yes, yes, we can do something about that. I don't care if it's 1%, 2%, or 3%, or 40%. If it's 1%, let's do it. Okay, any other question? I guess everybody's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Since we're still, we're talking about supplements, uh, yeah. would you be willing to comment a little bit on the uh, lecithin, the phosphatidylcholine again, and the, the nicotinic receptor story? Yeah. Yeah. In terms of harmless supplements that may be easy and have yeah. some some worth. So I think that's another uh, there's very good research from U U.S. researchers to suggest that, that uh, if you give people extra certain types of uh, supplements, you may be able to decrease the risk of, of bra altered brain development, and I think that's totally feasible as well. So I'm not wedded to one particular exposure, one particular micronutrient. I think um, that it may well be there's a whole range of micronutrients out there that you could disturb and you could uh, increase the risk of brain disorders. And I think, but that, that story, again, we need to, um, to build up more evidence. We can't, we're not ready, we're not ready for prime time. We can't tell women, keep taking, or take more le le lecithin or this vitamin, this or vitamin, that. I think we need to be very cautious about that message. It could backfire as well. We've got to be very careful about that. Great. Any other? Well, yeah, yep. Last question, yes ma'am. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know if, um, regarding vitamin D, if I, my brother has schizophrenia yes. and he's 72, yeah, yeah. if he takes vitamin D, yes. uh, would, would it help him at all? Uh, so the evidence suggests, and I've done clinical trials for vitamin D, we're doing one in London at the moment, um, I don't think the evidence is, is there that treating someone with vitamin D will cure their schizophrenia, just like treating a child with c c uh, spina bifida with folate won't make that brain rewire. Um, but many people with schizophrenia, and you'll know this, that, that they have bad diets, and they um, have unhealthy lifestyles with not enough physical activity, and sometimes they smoke and use alcohol. So taking vitamin D will be good for their bones, and that's, that's good, and we need, to, everyone needs a healthy diet. So I think what I tell p my patients, that I, I don't think taking vitamin D will cure your symptoms, but it will help your bone health. 